Welcome to the Truth Be Known podcast, bringing you the objective truth boldly, candidly, and without apology. Welcome to this week's episode. Welcome back to another episode of the Truth Be Known podcast. I'm Nathaniel Jolly. And I am Eki Tepsapornchai. Our brother, it's good to be back with you this morning. Um, it, it, we've got a good episode today, I think. It, it really kind of centers around the issue of discernment. Um, mm-hmm. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the He Gets Us campaign. And this would be an interesting dialogue because I've purposefully not looked into the campaign. And so uh, people are already thinking, how are you doing a podcast and you didn't do any of your research? Well, what I'm hoping we can do, <laughs> and I'm telling people up front, just grant me a little bit of grace here, um, is have a dialogue when things like He Gets Us comes up. Um, h- how do How do we go about what's the process of rightfully judging whether or not it's good and it's godly or if it's worldly. Um, I, I, we're seeing a lot of issues with discernment today. And we just, we, you know, we have another example in, you know, the, the revival so-called that's happened at Asbury and other places are seemingly, you know, trying to mimic that. Um, and the podcast is not about that, but Anytime those things happen, you, you really do see who has discernment, um, how and and where they're getting that discernment, right? Is it biblically informed or is it emotionally deformed or yeah. uh, uh, deformed, I said, but that's actually huh. true. Yeah. If you're basing it on motions, it is deformed. Um, you know, so you really do find out who has um, discernment and at what levels of discernment uh, people have because we have different, you know, degrees of discernment. And that doesn't necessarily make people who called this thing wrong unbelievers or anything like that. Right. Um, mm-hmm. You know, sometimes we have discernment in different areas, uh, but those things are worth taking notice. So the He Gets Us campaign. Uh, so we've got the Asbury Revival thing so-called going on. We've got the He Gets Us campaign. We've got the TV show, The Chosen. Um, and you've got all this stuff out here, right? And it's... Um, necessary for believers to make judgments about these things because if they're not biblical and you're exposing yourself to it what you're doing is feeding your mind you're renewing your mind in godlessness and in worldly yeah. ways so let's kind of jump in um i have seen tweets about he gets us um i have not read an entire single tweet about it nor did i see the um Oh, what do you call the big football game? Uh, the Super Bowl. Uh, I don't oh, watch Super the Bowl. Super Bowl. Yeah. Um, I don't have a TV, so clearly. <laughs> uh, so I didn't watch it. I don't know what the ad. I don't even know what the ad says. I just heard people say it was terrible and that yeah. sort of thing. And some people loved it. So jump in. What's your exposure? Um, wh- what have you thought about it so far? I want to see where this one goes. Yeah, and and we um we first learned a little bit about. He gets us um, really through the chatter within the SBC, right? So, I mean, Tom Buck especially had uh, pointed out that um, th- there's some dollars that was going from the SBC towards He Gets Us or some sort of support going on there. And in, in his investigation, he found out, um, at, you know, he reached out to the service, um, you know, pretending to be someone looking for a church from the LGBTQ community just to find out what they would say, really to test them, really. And, uh, and and they failed the test. I mean, they um, they went ahead and start pulling up lists of churches that were LGBTQ affirming. Um, so that raised a red flag in his eyes and raised a red flag in my eyes as well. There there's also you know the, just the title he gets us and some of what I've read from their website. Um, I, I think it seeks to portray Jesus in a way that's relatable. Um, it seeks to portray Jesus in a way that makes him one of us, makes him. More common makes uh, makes us to to think that hey this is someone that we would hang out with and you know he he would totally understand us and and that kind of thing um, and then the Super Bowl ads uh, they spent um, twenty million dollars on a couple of uh, TV ad spots one was thirty seconds another one was um, sixty seconds so ninety seconds total of exposure twenty million dollars there's a lot of criticism over the amount of money that was spent for those ads. And I, I saw an interview with um, one of the guys who's uh, 
I think he's the founder, uh, but he was mentioning that over a five-year period, it was their it was their goal to spend um, something like either five hundred million or one billion dollars, um, really on kind of the um, the, the marketing of um, of he gets us. So that that's been my exposure. I've I've seen some of the um, some of the ad spots. So I can see the concern, and I can also see why some people think it's great. And the goal of this organization, as far as I can tell, um, is that they're not. They're they're not looking to be an online church. They're they're not trying to really kind of establish their own ministry, but they're trying to um, evangelize or at least be a pre-evangelistic entity. I would say, um, in trying to get people to think about Jesus Christ, get people interested, and their goal is that uh, for people that reach out to them, that they would um, help forward them to um, a church nearby who could meet with them and and help discuss spiritual needs with them. And so there, there's a whole process that you can go through on the He Gets Us uh, website if um, you're a pastor or, or a church leader to um, apply to have your church being listed as one of the churches that they they would refer people to. Um, there, there's a lot of um, contribution going into this organization, including, um, I believe, the CEO of Hobby Lobby. Um, so there, there's a number of organizations that um, on the surface you would you, you would say that these are conservative organizations. You know, obviously I said the SBC was involved um, as well, at least for a time. Uh, but there are some, uh, there, there's some messaging here that, that uh, borders a little bit on, on wokeness. And, uh, and, and we can talk a little bit more about that uh, as we get into it. But yeah, that's, that's been my exposure. Um, just seeing the commercials, uh, reading some of their, uh, reading some of the stuff they had on their website and, uh, and, and what we know from SBC and Tom Buck. Yeah, now that you mention it, I do remember seeing a tweet about um, uh, the, them supporting uh, kind of LGBTQ friendly churches. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this is so there are a couple questions, I think, and I think this is going to be so important moving forward because we're going to be seeing a lot of these types of things. They've always been around, but now yeah. with the way social media is, it's kind of in your face all the time. Um, and so, you know, I think the first thing people ought to look at when these things come up is, well, I think it starts with a, a heart position, right? A heart disposition of, um, I would love it if this is biblical and it's true, but right. I need right. to test this. Um, and we can't be afraid of being critical in that sense. Um, and I think it, really our culture is so inundated with this idea of you can't be critical of anything, which is ironic because that in and of itself is a critical statement. But um, mm -hmm. that we've got to start with that place, right? We we need to be Bereans. Um, and uh, hopefully the guys listen to our podcast will understand what that means. Um, and so the I think the, the first things that we should look at is when people start bringing it to our attention, who are those people? Um, it's just like, I mean, the very first thing, right? So Tom Buck, for instance, well, I know Tom Buck to be a faithful pastor who loves yeah. God's word. He's faithful to God's word. And so I'm not going to just believe everything Tom says. Um, that's not the mm -hmm. point. But when faithful pastors are pointing out something, right, that should be a, a, a little checkbox that we acknowledge. You know, and then and then we just start asking diagnostic questions of this thing. Um, you know, as soon as, as soon as, now sometimes it's really easy, right? So if it's true that uh, they're supportive of LGBTQ friendly churches, then the, the search stops. I mean, we're done. That's a clear violation yeah. of the principles of scripture, um, of scripture. I mean, we told, we're told that the unrepentant homosexual um, will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so if there's an organization out there that is supporting churches that would um, that that would be okay with that kind of lifestyle in opposition to scripture, then we're done. And I don't think you need to look any further. And it, and I, I don't know. It'd be interesting to hear your thoughts on this. It seems to me that often, even in our own circles, that guys so desperately want to see people come to Christ that they almost sort of lose their discernment. On these things, and even when we have evidence of stuff like if if they support homosexuality, um, we sort of kind of yeah. set it aside, maybe given the benefit of the doubt, and say, well, maybe it's not really that bad. 
Um, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? I, I would say that the moment that's revealed, the, the search can be over. We know this is not godly uh, because you're in clear opposition yeah. to the scriptures. Yeah, and let's take uh, the example that we're mentioning. Um, you mentioned LGBTQ friendly. Uh, let me l- let's flesh that out first of all, and, and help the audience understand what we mean by that. Um, of course, we're we're not we're not um, we're not suggesting that you should be unfriendly towards anyone, right? Um, right. But we're talking about the affirming kind of churches where um, they will say that, yeah, you you can live that kind of lifestyle and and be a Christian without repenting of it. I think that's uh, that's the issue, and we know affirming is a better word. Yeah, Corinthians uh, chapter, yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and we know from First Corinthians that that Paul says, look, those who continue to live this kind of lifestyle, um, they're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. He uh, he he lists off a number uh, of different sins, and he says, such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, and in terms of um, being discerning, we are called to do that. There are a lot of people who are criticizing. Um, others, as you mentioned, for looking at these movements and trying to look at it through the lens of scripture to see if this is legitimate or not. And for some people, I think just, you know, if if something is going on and the name of Jesus is being used, just think the best and stop stop being so discerning. Uh, but Second Corinthians chapter 10, uh, verse 5 says, we are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, and we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. Now, Paul here is really talking about false ideas. He's, he's in, in 2 Corinthians, if you know the letter of 2 Corinthians, there were um, a group of people calling themselves super apostles who were not apostles at all. And uh, and, and they had uh, taken captive some of, uh, taken captive spiritually, some of the folks in Corinth into thinking that uh, these apostles were superior to the apostle Paul himself. And so when Paul says we we are destroying speculations, every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of Christ, and we're taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, um, that that's important. We we need to discern everything. And let me give uh, an Old Testament example too. In Deuteronomy chapter thirteen, uh, we have Moses, uh, the Lord using Moses to instruct the Israelites. Um, about prophets or dreamers um, who actually give true prophets or true dreams. And I and I had mentioned this before, but it's worth looking at just again. Deuteronomy 13, 1 says, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes true. So he's saying, look, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams comes, and even if the sign or wonder comes true concerning which he spoke to you, and then he says, let us go after other gods. Uh, well, then guess what? That is not a true prophet or, or someone who is given a true vision from God, but rather you are to execute that person. And again, I'm not suggesting that we execute people today, but I'm trying to show that even in the Old Testament, God was pointing out the fact that you could have a prophet or a dreamer of dreams who gives you a true prophecy that actually comes true. True in, in true prophecy in the sense that he says something, it actually comes true, or the vision comes true. Mm-hmm. And uh, that that is one of the tests of a true prophet. But then if he also says, let us go after other gods— well, you're to reject that person. Well, the way our society um, operates today, and, and a lot of, I would say, American Christianity is that, well, if we see any kind of sign of a dream or vision, let forget whether it actually comes true or not, even if they call themselves a, a prophet, uh, we're going to go ahead and follow that person. Um, but yeah. the real test, uh, again, Deuteronomy 13, if they say, let us go serve after other gods, that, that's going to be the real test. So in other words, the the doctrine what is it that um, this entity is is really pitching to you? That that's going to be the test of whether it is truly from from God or not. So yeah, as as we think about um, that, the he gets us, and I, I think your your question. Re- repeat again what your question was. I know that was kind of a long wind up. Yeah, um, I I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you know, we're 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 talking well, we're, about we're talking about discernment. Yeah, yeah, we're talking about discernment, and the the question was kind of centered around um, the the fact that sometimes people seem to be willing to overlook some right, some, right. that that was it, some right issues there. Right there. for the sake of hopefulness. Now, exactly. it, it, let me just let me just interject there because that verse you read, I I think it's so I- important, and I I mean just relevant. Um, the whole Bible is relevant, but when we talk about relevance, I mean that we just witnessed in my mind that verse in play in, in in a very real way, because rather than dreams and visions that are coming true, people often look at the supposed results 
and do exactly yeah. the same thing. Oh, people yeah. are saying they're praising God. It must be godly. Oh, people are saying the name of Jesus. It must be godly. Oh, people are all gathering together and singing. It must be from God. Um, but that really is doing the same thing because, folks, it matters which Jesus you're worshiping. Uh, it matters yeah. why you're worshiping. It matters why you go to these things. It matters what the foundational doctrines are upon which these things are built. And if those things are built on sand, as it were, then it's not good and it's not godly. Now, I, I think sometimes we confuse in the area of discernment, there's confusion between what is godly and how God in his sovereignty sometimes works despite the godlessness, right? right. And we confuse God's graciousness, where he may indeed mm -hmm. save people in something heretical. We confuse that with it being God-ordained God, in the sense of it being a godly thing. And and yeah. we just can't do that. I think I think we can say, praise God, he is such a big God that he can work in the midst of evil and he can bring good out of that. But that doesn't mean that he has approved of the thing itself. Right. There's lots of testimonies of guys who were saved uh, under heretics, under yeah. you know all kinds of things, but that's not because the message was good or right or that they were even of God. It's that God worked in his sovereign graciousness despite those things. Um, so we've got to keep those things separate. And, and so I think that passage we've been seeing a lot of in application Right. Um, it, we we yeah. see it in the form of pragmatism. We see something that looks like it's working. And so instead of a sign or a dream or a vision following a prophet, we see the sign of pragmatism. And then we say, oh, it must be God. Um, but that's just not always the case. And, I, you know, we have, you know, Paul tells Timothy in First Timothy to pay close attention to his life and his doctrine and then tells him to persevere in that. And so. It, it's yeah. our duty to do those things. So we talk about the He Gets Us thing. And for the first time, I've just pulled up their website just as an example. So already, I, I know that there are faithful pastors who are putting up red flags. So I'm thinking about that. There's evidence that um, th this group supports uh, a, of the affirmation of unrepentant sin. It, it really doesn't matter what it is. If If they treated drunkards or wife beaters or anything the, the same way, right? We would have the same issue. So they support churches that affirm unrepentant sin. Now I'll go to their website. And I, I mean, it, it, it takes, it, it took me five minutes, right? So uh, if you go to their about page, and this is just good research, right? Go to, go to the entity or whatever, go to their about page and just read um, with, 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 the intention of seeing if if there's anything that jumps out to you. So the first couple of statements, I'm going to read the paragraph. It may, maybe there are a lot of people that haven't heard this. It, it says, this all started with a diverse group of people passionate about the authentic Jesus of the Bible. That is already a red flag for me, uh, but I'll keep reading. While much has been said about him, much is still misunderstood, we, and we're confident that as people clearly understand, read, and learn for themselves about who Jesus is, They'll find wisdom, hope, and peace unlike any other offered. That that's fine. That's that's true. Um, second yeah. paragraph. Be assured, mm -hmm. though, that we are not quote left or quote right or a political organization of any kind. Now, let me just stop right there. Uh, I I understand what they're trying to do, but here's the reality: your politics are informed by your beliefs, and they're inseparable. Mm -hmm. Right. You, 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 there's no unbiased position that humans can take. All right. Um, well, well, we'll keep going. We're not we're also not affiliated with any particular church or denomination. We simply want everyone to understand the authentic Jesus as he is depicted in the Bible. The Jesus. Now, this is what's important. The Jesus of radical forgiveness, compassion and love. All right. Let me just stop there. I, I do want to do the next paragraph, and we'll be done with that. But I, I mean, just well, Eki, what are some of the things that jumped out to you that seem that was there anything that seemed off or unusual or well, things that would make you want to pry a little yeah. more? Right, right. So 
I, I want to ask you about this because the very first sentence um, you said that there was a red flag. And and let me ask you, I think I know which word it is, but the first sentence says this all started with a diverse group of people passionate about the authentic Jesus of the Bible. So which word jumped out at, at you as kind of a red flag? I think I know which one it is. Yeah, there's two. The very first one was diverse. Yep. Be yep. Because that That's language one. is is specific. And it's specifically used amongst a group of people that have a yeah. theological background that's contrary, yeah. really, to Scripture. So that's the first one. The second one is using the phrase authentic Jesus. Mm -hmm. This is often used in theologically liberal circles yeah. when they're yeah. trying to paint Jesus in a different light. Now, the everyday person right. may not realize that. But yeah. anytime, I mean, this is why I, I love the simplicity of not adding to um, how we define Christianity. This is why I don't like it when we put things in front of Christian. I'm not a this kind of Christian or that kind of Christian. I, I'm a Christian. I follow Christ. Um, yeah. And w when we use language like that, that's steep in, I mean, the diverse group of people, that's coming from critical race. back. That, that, that is critical theory background. Um, and I don't know how steep they are in it, yeah. Yeah. But if they're using that language, it does already tell me that there's a background here that um, it is going to impact the way they're presenting Christ. Now, in the third paragraph, it comes out even more, which is just very interesting. It didn't take long. Uh, but right, it, OK, right. so, so anyway, you go. Yeah, ahead. so I, I, I want I wanted to ask that question for this reason, because. Um, someone who is maybe not culturally informed could easily read that first sentence and say, there's nothing wrong with that. Because if you just look at what it literally means, nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong. I mean, hey, the the gospel is to all tribes, tongues, and nations. Uh, it yeah. could very well be that a Christian organization is very diverse. It's great that it is. It doesn't necessarily have to be, right? But it's great that it is. And uh, of course, we want the authentic Jesus rather than the fake Jesus. You and I would agree with that. We would say that well, one of the problems with society today is that I believe people are trying to create a Jesus in their own image rather than following the true Jesus of the Bible. So in that sense, we should be passionate about the authentic Jesus of the Bible. Um, I think what um, what is catching your eye as well as what's catching my eye is that when you hear and, and read as much um, about uh, the people who are in the progressive circles, the ones whom we know uh, deny the authority, inerrancy, and sufficiency of Scripture, we start to recognize the words and the buzz terms that they use. And so that that's that's what's setting off some of the red flags as we read this. It doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it reads like someone who is from one of those circles. And again, the second paragraph, be assured though that we're neither left or right. Um, that's another one of those phrases that normally when I hear that, it's someone who actually sides with um, progressive um, ideologies. Uh, I'm not saying that's that's all, all the time. Of course, you know we we don't want to. Uh, our goal as Christians is not to be left or right. Our goal is to stand upon the truth, right? And the truth is going to take us wherever it's going to take us. And in, in this country, I think the truth more often sides with the right than the left. But in other countries, the truth is going to side more with the left than the right. It's all relative to what's going on in, in that country. Um, but when people have to make the point that we're neither left nor right. Um, normally I hear that kind of disclaimer from those who are really left, but they're trying to say that they're neither left or nor, nor right. Um, so, so those are just some phrases that we're picking up on as, as we go through. Um, <clears throat> and, and then when you read through it and you can read through the rest of this, as I recall, I, I don't think there is a clear gospel, uh, reference, um, anywhere here in the about us. Now, some people might say, well, you know they're they're trying to avoid um, over scrutiny from whatever, or they're they're trying to just draw people in without and, and leaving it to the churches to to give the gospel, and and I think that gets into another issue, and and this is they're all related. It's really kind of um, relying on pragmat pragmatic methods. It's pragmatism, trying to do what is practical in order to get people into the churches, and and I would say that some of the churches that at least started off as being LGBTQ um, affirming, or at least uh, try to um, not make statements uh, about what is um, biblical sexuality, what, what God says in the Bible about sexuality. Uh, I would say a lot of those churches probably took those positions because they didn't want to scare off people. They, they didn't want to take a position 
that was um, that that was so divisive and so polemical, but rather they want to draw them in, win them over with love, and then show them from the scriptures. Uh, now I'm thinking the best. I believe that's what a lot of churches sought to do. But I think what we saw over time is that a lot of those churches just ended up being full blown LGBTQ um, affirming. Yeah. So there, there's a pragmatism um, to me when I read this. There's there's just a feeling of pragmatism in this, uh, and there was a in looking at listening to the commercials. There was a feeling of pragmatism as well, doing everything we can to try to make Jesus sound like he's one of us. And uh, of course, Jesus was 100 percent man. He is 100 percent man, right? I mean, from the time he was incarnated, and Hebrews tells us that he can sympathize with all of our weaknesses. So there there is some truth to that, um, and yet. He is distinct from us because he is also 100% God and he is also without sin. Yeah. And so even, even the name of this group, he gets us, you know, you always want to stop and think about the messaging because there's, there's always some thinking that there, there's a lot of thinking that goes on into these names and titles. And especially when you think about the funding that's going into these organizations and you get C CEOs of companies like Hobby Lobby, um, marketing is a big deal and, and what, yeah. what they choose to name themselves mm -hmm. is a big deal. And and so there's a lot of thinking that goes into these names, and and even the the title he gets us, um, it it feels seeker sensitive, it feels pragmatic, and and it does not feel it does not feel like it, it's a true reverent uh, reference to Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and I would say, you know, okay, it, so if you don't know buzzwords and, and you're not. Um, you know, you haven't been steeped into kind of the theologically liberal language. Um, th that's okay. There are just questions you can ask uh, and things that you should realize when you start reading this. Um, the, the first thing you should know is that if they're if they have enough money to do Super Bowl ads, right, then that means they have people who have thought through writing these things yeah. very carefully mm -hmm. and, and intentionally. So even if you didn't know, you could just start reading this and ask yourself the question, well, it, it, they they carefully thought about every word they put here. So why would they feel the need to tell me that it was a diverse group of people? Why wasn't yeah. it just people passionate about Jesus? Um, you, you know, why are they using that language? Is there something significant? And then you go do some research and then you quickly can discover and so you don't really have to even need those backgrounds as long as you just understand that when when a company or a, whatever this is, when something like this has the money and backing that it does, it's not like, um, you know, the 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 guy planning a small church who's got a pastor and counsel and preach and evangelize and he's trying to write bylaws. <laughs> Um, and he just misses things because it's so much, right? You, you don't have the resources. So you can just ask those questions. But I, I want to go on in this paragraph. So in the second one, so you got the left yep. or the right thing. Um, that, that's always a red flag because now you've just drawn my attention to the political sphere, right? It, that was totally unnecessary. Uh, and, then it, and, and, here's the and here is another big red flag. We're also not affiliated with any particular church and denomination. Now, if yeah. you don't understand why that's a red flag, it's because you have very poor ecclesiology. And, and I don't mean that harshly, um, but it means you don't understand God's design for the body of Christ and where the church fits into that. And, and th that's a huge theological flag because God, it, it's not to say that parachurch organizations can't be helpful, but let, let me just talk about churches like a parachurch organization like Heart Cry ministries for instance run by paul washer um it, it is not absent the local church uh, in fact it is submitted to a local church and that is a biblical design and so the fact that these guys have sort of said you know what we're going to do our own thing we're not accountable to any church not attached to any church that is already outside of what we see uh in in scripture god's plan for christianity is that everything happens out of the local church everything uh our evangelism whatever ministries we might do uh you can look at grace community church i mean they have tons of ministries and and some that are very large but yeah. you know what they're they're all born out of a local church from people who are uh faithful in that local church so the fact that they're detached from the church is in and of itself for me a huge red flag 
Now, they, they might argue that what they're trying to do is in support of the local churches, because, uh, again, their um, their marketing campaign, or at least when I listen to the founder or one of their leaders, is that they they want to draw attention to Jesus and then forward those people onto the local churches. I, I, and I think by itself, that description sounds great. I, I think my concern is the discernment of which of those churches are actually trustworthy. Um, and, and if you're not affiliated yeah. with a particular church or denomination, question is, well, do you have a statement of faith? Do you, do you have... Do you have something that's guiding your decisions in terms of of how you're passing people on to uh, to churches? And and quite honestly, it doesn't look like there is. Um, so it looks like they're treating any churches who are really willing to be a part of this uh, campaign um, to to be partners and to to be people that uh, would reach out to people. But look, you and I know that there are many churches that are not only lacking discernment, but there are many churches that unfortunately are not even teaching the true gospel. And yeah. I would hate to spend this amount of dollars only to forward people to a church that is not actually preaching from the Bible. Now they do say here that they want everyone to understand the authentic, there's that word again, authentic Jesus as he's depicted in the Bible, um, the Jesus of radical forgiveness, compassion, and love. And yes, he's all those things. And again, radical, uh, another word that often shows up in these kinds of circles. But if you don't know that, um, then there's nothing wrong with these statements because Jesus is about forgiveness, compassion, and love. You know, when we think about him sitting with the tax collectors, having dining with tax collectors and 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 harlots, and one of the Pharisees asked, why do you, you, you know, why do you dine with these people? And Jesus ended up responding, look, uh, it's not it's not the um, those who are healthy that are in need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come come to call the um, the the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And, and so, a lot of people like to use that as um, support for this. That look, Jesus gets us. He he met with the tax collectors. He met with the sinners. He met with the lowliest of low in society. But they have to remember that he met with them for that purpose of calling them to repentance. And he was ignoring those yeah. who were self righteous, but that that and to call people to repentance that comes right back down to the gospel because the only way we can accomplish the same thing um, in terms of calling people to repentance is through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And and so again, we want to be sure that not only our churches are very clear, but these kinds of campaigns and these kinds of organizations, um, events that happen, uh, TV shows that come up. Ask yourself the question. Is the gospel clear? And and I can't overemphasize this enough because Jesus Christ, when he gave us the Great Commission, he said, go and make disciples of all the nations. He told the disciples to, to be my witnesses. And when you look through the book of Acts, what do they do? They preach the gospel. We are saved by faith, and we are awaiting the second coming of Jesus Christ. What What's going to happen in between them? It's the evangelism. It's, it's sharing the gospel. It's making disciples. It's helping people to know who Jesus Christ is is. And in all of these movements and events, I'm looking for the gospel. I'm looking for that emphasis that Jesus Christ gave us. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think we have to understand that to take a position of not being attached to a local church is a non-convictional position. It means they have no real conviction of who this so-called authentic Jesus is they're offering people, right? And, and so it, there's no distinction between good doctrine and bad doctrine uh and the and and that's i mean that's inevitable that's the position you have to have when you refuse right. to be associated with a local church now uh it it sometimes it's harder uh because we it, when you talk about a local church maybe one's reform maybe you know one's not and and then you have to deal with uh you know primary secondary issues but that's better than just having no conviction. So what if what, what if people end up in Joel Osteen's church from He Gets yeah. Us? Because I, I'll tell you, he gives the same kind of message. Um, and if and and if you come to, you know, believe in what's preached at Joel Osteen's church, then you're gonna have a rude awakening in eternity because they don't preach the gospel and they don't preach Jesus of the Bible. So they, they're red flags for that reason. And I, I and again. Just the fact that God, the 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 church, right, is the, is the pillar and support of truth, um, n not these things that could be helpful if they're attached to a local church. So I just think it's always a red flag when, 
not necess- not even just when they're outside the local church, but when they make a big point about telling you they're outside of the local church. Yeah, right. Um, right. And, and, you know, if you just look at ministries that are parachurch organizations that are detached from the local church, I doubt you'll find a single one that is solidly biblical. Mm. I mean, y- you might, uh, but I doubt it because fundamentally um, they're demonstrating their value for the church in the fact that they're, they're disconnected. Right. And, and then, I mean, again, second paragraph. So, I mean, we, we've got all kinds of red flags, really. Um, in And the last statement, I, I would just we've got to ask diagnostic questions. So if they were very careful about what they said when they were thinking about the character and nature of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God incarnate, why would they say that he's the Jesus of radical forgiveness, compassion, and love. Why do they only pick the 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 three characteristics that would appeal to every godless person and not talk about God's holiness, uh, Christ's yeah. righteousness? Um, it, there's no segue into – there's no mention of repentance. What's more compassionate yeah. and, and loving than repentance? So they specifically left all of those things out. I want to know why. Um, th- th- Which, that's uh, a red flag way, for me. When, when, when the, <clears throat> yeah, and by the way, folks, when, when the gospel ends up getting watered down, that's the first thing to go. It's the sin and repentance. Mm-hmm. And, and there really is, um, as I'm looking at this, there's no mention uh, of sin. I mean, they do mention that Jesus Christ died, he was resurrected, he returned to heaven, and he is alive today. Th- those are, but those are um, very, th- those kinds of truths are, are not the kind of truths that will offend. And of course, it's not our goal to offend, but we understand that the truth right. does offend, right? And so they're they're trying to put together the least offensive approach possible, um, when really the question should be, um, what is the most biblical way possible that we can um, put something together that helps people understand what we're about and, and helps them to understand where they can go to get help, right? And and so what we have here is language that, again, and I go back to um, seeker-sensitive, um, being pragmatic, um, trying to win people into the church first. And, you know, I we, you, you've seen this, I've seen this. There's also a lot of people that when they find out our views on things, um, you know, Biblical counseling, for for example, you know they're going to say, "Well, you're just you're the kind of person that's just driving people out of the church, right?" So it's not even a discussion as to whether what we're saying is biblical or not. It's a discussion as to what's attracting people and what's driving them away. Well, that that's that should never be the the basis of decisions for any kind of church leaders. What's going to attract them or what's going to drive away? It's it's the basis of the decisions should be. What is glorifying to God? What what is biblical? What do we see in Scripture? And so you're right. I the Jesus of radical forgiveness, comp- compassion, and love is he all those things? He is absolutely all those things. And and he even says, uh, "Come to me, all who are who, all of you who are weary, you know, who are weary and heavy laden, yeah. and and I will give you rest." Right. But even then, as he makes those kinds of statements, he's making statements to people who are weighed down by the effects of their sin, right? So even as he says yeah. something like that, which is which is a very welcoming statement, um, it's a statement that can't be fully appreciated unless the hearers understand um, that they can't work for their salvation, um, that they have sins that, that leave them co- convicted as being unrighteous before a holy God. And so they need Jesus Christ. They, they need him to be able to do the work for them. Yeah, absolutely. And, and and the thing that I think is helpful is that what we're not looking for is, oh, do we find in the Bible that Jesus um, radically forgave and was compassionate and loved? That's not what we're looking for. That That's not good discernment. What, what, what we're looking at is uh, th- through the understanding that they chose these words carefully and and what have they neglected to put in here? You you could have put you could have put a lot of other things that would have pointed to Jesus's other attributes and his central purpose for coming without it being um, overly offensive. You could have talked about how Jesus came to you know save those who were sick and not the healthy. Yeah. I mean, you could have did the, done those things, and they didn't. Um, and, and by this stage, I'm I'm already like, yeah, this isn't a biblical organization. Uh, I actually just read the the rest of it, and I'm I'm terrified that this is that this is not a good thing. And they just continue on, and they tell you what they want ultimately you to believe, 
right? They, they go on to talk about how it wouldn't be hard to guess that we're led by Jesus fans and followers, um, people who believe that he was much more than just a good God, profound teacher. Uh, they talk about Jesus being the son of God. They give a lot of facts without pointing mm-hmm. to why those facts matter. Right. And, and then there's in the third paragraph, there's a statement. Um, we also have included many voices. Now, that's a, a, a word, no. Um, no. A, a phrase, right, that we would want to be aware of. We have included many voices in our work here, welcoming diverse perspectives, backgrounds and experiences. Well, let, let me just tell you right now, when we're talking about Jesus, his message, why he came, who he was, what he did on the cross, your perspective, your background, and your experience doesn't matter at all. Yeah. At all. The only thing I can bring to the person and work of Jesus Christ is sin. My perspective doesn't change who he is or what he's done. It doesn't add light to it. It doesn't enrich it. The only thing it could possibly do is taint it. And so when when I read things like that, um, you've just convinced me that your goal is something other than presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ with bibl- biblical accuracy. Um, and, and then they go on and experiences. And why have they welcomed diverse perspective backgrounds and experiences? Well, to help us address the many concerns and issues we all face. Well, I don't need your experience to address the sin in my life. You don't need my experience. No. You need Christ, and you need the truth of the gospel. And and so this is an elevation of man. This is very man-centric. What, what, what I'm reading, this is actually just pure humanism. This, this is yeah, humanism. And, yeah, this goes back, again, to the whole pragmatism. You know, and, and someone looking at this, uh, defending it, will, will say, look, this is just— we all come from different backgrounds. We all have different perspectives. We all have different experiences. And we're all trying to just figure out how do we bring the truth and contextualize it within those environments? What's wrong with that? And again, like I said, a lot of these organizations, I think they start off with the right motivation, um, but they don't trust in the power of the gospel by itself. You know, let me let me just read from 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the first five verses, and this will be very... Uh, these are very familiar verses to anyone who's been a Christian. Um, and when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or wisdom proclaiming to you the testimony of God, for I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, Paul contrasts that with the superiority, the superiority of speech or of wisdom. And he goes on to say, I was in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my message and preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that, and whenever you see those words, so that, they often point to the purpose, so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. And so a lot of times we just think that the simple truth of the Bible is not strong enough, that we have to add our own ideas. And and that by itself, um, to me, does not prove anyone's an unbeliever. It just proves that someone doesn't trust enough in the power uh, of the biblical message itself. And so, and so that that's that's the concern that that I see here. Um, and, and especially when you start to point out those things of diverse perspectives, perspectives and backgrounds, because it implies that we need to dress up the gospel in a different way, or we need to dress up the truth in a different way to reach into different backgrounds. And, and let me add this too. So there were a couple of ads. I did see the two ads that ran during the Super Bowl. And and one of them um, was uh, about being being a child in faith. Um, so it, it was just showing some videos of, of children. And, and, uh, and it had a statement that um, I thought was a sloppy statement. It said that um, Jesus, uh, Jesus did not want us to act like adults, which is silly. Okay. And I, I know that's playing off of having childlike faith, but that is very specific um, in its application. You know, Paul would go on yeah. to say that, look, you're no longer children. We need to stop acting like children. But it, it was it was a simple ad about just being childlike. The second one was about loving your enemy. So it had a bunch of depictions of people yelling and screaming at each other. And it made the point that Jesus loved those whom we hated. We need to love our enemies. Now, <clears throat> those commercials by themselves, if that's all you know about them, you wouldn't think that they're overly political, 
Um, but the images that were running in the background, even CNN in response to those images, um, said that the images suggest that, and this was in favor of Jesus, saying in defense of the ads, that it does seem like they're portraying a Jesus who is um, who is in favor of women's rights and progressive racial and mm. social activism, right? So those images in the background are, are kind of portraying those kinds of messages because you're trying to reach into maybe a group that um, feels like uh, they're they're left out or, or being oppressed or um, or they're you know just somehow not included in in the plan of yeah. God. And so they're, again, just resorting to pragmatism, um, but we don't need pragmatism. What we need is the gospel. We need to share the gospel. We need to, yeah. and, you know, even going back again to this description, this narrative, yeah, Jesus, he came to earth, he died, he was resurrected, returned to heaven, is alive today. All of it, absolutely true. You, you know what I've, and, and recently it was uh, Ron Hensel um, that that brought up the, uh <clears throat> substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. Um, we, we call it the penal substitutionary atonement. The fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross as our substitute to die for our sins. Um, that is a very, uh, that, that, that should be uh, an embraced doctrine that that should be embraced by all Christians, because that to me is at the very center of the gospel that Jesus Christ died in our place to die <clears throat> in order to pay for our sins. Um, yeah. But that is also a very, as it turns out, it's a very controversial doctrine within "quote unquote" Christian circles. There are some who do not believe that, and so I—that's uh, one of the things that jump out to me. He came to Earth, he died, resurrected, returned to heaven, is alive today. It's a very convenient way of stating those facts without having to touch yeah. up on the fact that Jesus died for our sins, which is something that I would want to include there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think let me say this: what I'm not doing is attributing motives. Right. I, I'm I, I'm I'm not I'm not looking for what's in their heart. I don't care about any of that. Genuinely, I don't care because I can't know. Right. Um, all I can know is is what they're presenting going to lead people to Christ. Right. The Christ of the Bible um, is what they're doing. Biblical. Is this going to be harmful or helpful? Does it um, mar the character and nature of Christ? Um, you know, is it righteous? Is it blasphemous? Those are the things I'm looking at. And uh, there's so much liberal language in here. Um, that uh, again, the, the welcoming diverse perspectives, if you understand that lingo, I mean, this is the same kind of thing that the new hermeneutic, the, the new hermeneutic, right? Um, w w which is basically interpreting the Bible through the lens of either people's response to it, um, yeah. or things like their perspective and their background it's it, this is just theological liberalism uh in the language and so that that's why it matters but if you didn't know that just asking the question well why does that why would they say that why does that matter but then the very next sentence is our hope okay so now you're going to find out what it is they want you to get from what they've said so far or from their organization. Well, our hope is that you see how Jesus experienced challenges and emotions just like we have. Hmm. What? I Okay, I, it's good to know that, but Jesus didn't come so that we could know how he experienced challenges and emotions hmm. just like we did. He came so that we could be saved. He came so that there would be a propitiation for our sins. He came so that we could be reconciled to the Father. Um, that's why he came. Not And so this is an appeal to an, a, just emotional attachment. Oh, and oh, okay. And you know what? Now we're kind of starting to see the picture of what he gets us communicates, right? Because they chose that, that on, they chose that very purposefully. So what does it mean? What is it communicating when you read all of this? Um, for most people, it's going to communicate just very simply this. Jesus is just like me. Yeah, I can like Jesus. My Whatever my political leaning is, Jesus is just like me. Whatever my troubles and issues are in this world, Jesus is just like me. Oh, okay. Well, the problem with this is the the theological end is that you're just like Jesus. In other words, Jesus is not someone that you need to submit to. He's not someone that you need to change you. He's not someone 
that needs to uh, overcome sin in your life because he's just like you and you're just like yeah. him. Um, and, and so it creates all these issues and they just go on. I, I kind of want to run through the rest of this. I, 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 I only read the first few uh, paragraphs and I was like, that's enough. But um, we're, we're also sharing Jesus's openness to people that others might have excluded. I mean, again, on the surface, that's fine, but that's not the message of Christ. His message went out to all. Well, what was his message? So far, what they've told you is his message is that he's just like you. And so you're just like him. And though you may see religious people as often hypocritical or judgment, know that Jesus saw that too. Except the problem with that is Christianity is a religion, and we're told what true Christianity, what true yeah. religion is in Scripture. Um, so even the Bible does not use religion exclusively as a negative term, but that's all they give you here. Um and they and and he's they're saying he didn't like that either. Instead, Jesus taught and offered, here's another radical compassion and stood up for the marginalized. I mm. I, I mean, this is just steeped in liberal lingo. Now, what I'm not doing yeah. is I'm not attributing I, I I'm I'm not talking about motives. I'm not saying they are or they aren't liberal. They seem to be supported by a lot of politically conservative groups. And so I don't know if they're just trying to use the language of the left to attract people. Right, um, right. And I don't care. Right. If I'm going to be if, if I'm going to be faithful in a critique, I've got to leave those thoughts aside and just approach the content that's being put out. Uh, but Jesus didn't come. For the marginalized, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Hum mankind is not marginalized. Mankind is rebellious against a holy God. And the love of God, which mm -hmm. is a compassionate love, sent Christ, right, to die for all of those who would put their faith and trust in him, repenting of their sin, believing in his life, his death, and his resurrection. Th that's what Christ came for. He, he didn't come to offer radical compassion outside of the call of repentance uh and so this language is extraordinarily dangerous now it is interesting because i did see some um some folks who are politically on the left uh catch this kind of language and i did see a few people tweeting things like you know something to the effect of they're they're using our language but they're they're trying to secretly get in and trick us and things like that <laughs> Um, I, I don't know if that's what's going on, but I do know yeah. that they are using very theologically liberal and damning language. Because if you just came to the conclusion of who Jesus is based on the picture they're painting, it's not the Jesus of the Bible. And then they go yeah. on to say the last sentence, ultimately, we want people to know his teaching and how he lived while here on earth. The teaching is fine. How we live here on earth, I'm not so sure about that. Um, and then they go to say, this will be the starting point to understanding him and his message. So in other words, the starting point to understanding what I presume they mean the gospel is that you first come to understand that Jesus is just like you and you're just like him. The problem is if that's, if, if that's your understanding of Christ, you won't make it to repentance because if he's just like you and you're just like him, why do you need to repent? He's just effectively a better version of you. If anything, this would just lead to moralism or legalism. Yeah, it could if you just left it there. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they're they're hoping that uh, the churches that they forward people onto, uh, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. They're, they're hoping that the churches that they forward them onto will actually share the gospel. But yeah, the, the lingo is going to uh, draw. Uh, it, it is really trying to draw a certain segment of people. And uh, the, the folks that are, are going to be drawn, I don't know that they're going to be ready to hear the true gospel or not. Now, again, we say the gospel is the power of God, so we just want to get the gospel to them. Um, but yeah, the, the, the language and, and the approach, and, and even, again, the title of this organization, He Gets Us. You know, let's think about that for a moment. He Gets Us. Normally, when we say that, we, we're trying to say that someone understands us. They, they understand how we think. They understand how we feel. And, and it's a way to really affirm your way of thinking and feeling. 
that 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 he gets us. It's okay to think this way. It's okay to feel th this way. Um, the problem is that when you look at all humanity, when you understand the true gospel, you know that that phrase "he gets us" is not a good thing, because what he gets is that we are sinners, right? And uh, and that's the exact reason yeah. why he went to the cross to to die for us. So. Um, you're, you're using lingo to, to make it sound like he can he, he relates to us and he can affirm you and, and he can accept you and all that. Well, ultimately, the call is that everyone needs to repent. Everyone needs to repent and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And only in that way we have salvation. So in some ways, when I think of it that way, too, this almost feels like a little bit of a bait and switch. Um, yeah. Let me give you this kind of lingo um, so that even if we're going to give you the true gospel, it's really kind of a bait and switch where you're being drawn in this way. And now we're telling you, no, you're a sinner and you just need to repent, right? I, I think it's a lot easier just to come in with the truth. Jesus Christ came. John 3, 16, start there. For God so loved the world. So that there's a loving message right there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that he who believes in him will not perish, but will have um, eternal life. And the whole reason why we're going to perish, well, it's because we're sinners. Right. So it's it's better just to do things and, and to to dress things up the way the Bible dresses these things up and to try to avoid as much as possible this kind of pragmatism that leads into the the language that that can be confusing, can can be misleading and, and titles that make you think one thing. And then when you see the truth, it it just looks like a marketing campaign. Yeah, yeah. Well, guys, I hope this has been helpful, but you've gotten the clear gospel a couple times, and that's really what we've got to get to people. Look, people aren't going to be saved if they just understand that Jesus can relate to our sufferings, though he can. Um, yeah. They're going to be saved. They're going to be saved if they come to trust on the Lord Jesus Christ, repenting of their sins, believing in his life, his death, and his resurrection. Uh, and that's what we've got to get to. Anything short of getting to that really isn't loving and compassionate at all. You're just stringing people along with their emotions. Um, yeah. And so we don't want to do that. We've got to be discerning, guys. And th these kinds of things are going to continually come out. And I, again, I think we have to be careful that we aren't attributing motives. Um, I don't know what their motives are. They may be wonderfully sincere, um, genuinely saved Christians themselves and just have really poor doctrine or got caught up in pragmatism, um, it, it, which would be sinfulness, but and we can all get caught up in those things. So we we don't want to go there, but we still have to be able to say this thing is is dangerous, stay away, or this is a good thing we should help promote it. Um, we, we've just got to be able to do those things. So um, thank you guys for listening. Hope this was helpful to you. And until next time, let the truth be known. The Truth Be Known podcast is a theologically driven, gospel-centered program serving the body of Christ by bringing biblical truth to bear on issues facing the church today. Subscribe to the Truth Be Known podcast by using the podcast app on your Apple or Android device or listen online at strivingforeternity.org in the podcast section.